reading today is in Psalms 74, 7 through 9. <clears throat> they burned down your sanctuary to the ground. They defiled the dwelling place of your name. They said in their heart, we were across them completely. They burned every place where God was worshipped in the land. We are giving no miraculous signs. No prophets are left, and none of us know how long this will be. So be it. So I hope you're keeping up with your readings. And if you're reading, you should have finished Jeremiah this week. And you should have read this psalm. And this psalm is not one that was designed to be sung. It was a cry out to Jesus time. You ever felt like he wasn't around? That he was silent in your life? That all the things in your life you didn't like? You didn't understand? Why are these things happening to me? I know I felt that way. <laughs> Many times. But then if you look and you see that invaders are invading your land and they've actually destroyed the temple where God lives, what do you think then? Is he gone? Did he finally forsake me? Well, if you look in your bulletins, Psalm 73 has nothing to do with Psalm 74, a collection of psalms and hymns and praises to God. And I don't know why they put Psalm 73 before Psalm 74, but <laughs> look at the ending of Psalm 73. It's in the middle of your bulletin. Yet I am always with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel and later receive me in glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And on earth I desire no one besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but my God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those far from you will surely perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to draw near to God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may proclaim all your works. Maybe you didn't recognize some of those songs and we didn't realize we didn't have all the lyrics this morning. <laughs> we'll get it down when we sing it again. But there's got to be times when you cry out to Jesus. There's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with saying we're going to close with a karaoke song saying, why me, Lord? But the why me, Lord, is not really the intent of what I'm talking about now. But there are plenty of times when you say, why me, Lord? Why am I going through this? I don't understand. But remember Jesus' last words before He left His disciples here on earth. He said, it's not for you to know, but I will give you power to proclaim the gospel message. The same Holy Spirit that he mentions in John's, it says, I will send the paraclete, the comforter, to comfort you in all these times of trouble. So even if you look out and see the temple of God destroyed and foreigners in your land, you can say, I am at peace because I know my God will never forsake me. He will never leave me. So that you can praise Him in the storm. That was the second song. And so that you can realize that He's making all things new. Maybe you'll see that in this world. Maybe you won't. But if you are His child, if you belong to Him, when the temple lies in ruins, you know that you have a home eternal in heaven because of your faith in Jesus Christ. Now I can stop right there, but I'm not going to. But think about that. Think about the hope that you have and fix your eyes on Jesus. So what do you do when God's temple lies in ruins? When you think God is gone, when you think maybe He's lost control, that He doesn't care anymore, or why have you allowed this to happen, God? Know that He's got a bigger picture than you can ever understand. Know that He's in complete control. Know that He does not lie. What He says will come true. That His ways are faithful and true and just, and that no thing, no thing whatsoever can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. So I can understand how Paul could write that, those words, I can do all things through Christ that gives me strength. Psalm 74 
that Merle read from is a maskeel. What does that mean? I don't know, and I probably didn't pronounce it right. It's not a song. It was never intended to be written to music. It was something to lament and woe over. To cry out saying, I simply do not understand. I am at my wit's end. I don't have anywhere else to turn. I am completely crushed and complexed. My enemies are all around me. What can I do but cry out to God and say, why? You know what? That's exactly what happened to God's son when he came to this earth and he gave up his life to save you and I. And he said, not my will, but yours, Father. And he also said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Well, if you've been reading in your Bible, this week you read Lamentations and you read Ezekiel. So I've got a little uh, Bible project video about Lamentations. The book of Lamentations, it's a unique book in the Old Testament that contains five poems from an anonymous author who survived and is now reflecting back on the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem and the destruction and the exile that followed. Remember the whole story from the book of Second Kings. The fall of Jerusalem and the exile was the most horrendous catastrophe in Israel's history up to this point. So remember, God had promised Abraham the land. He'd given David victory to make Jerusalem Israel's capital. And from David came the royal line of kings. You had God's presence there in the temple, and that's where the priests maintained the rituals of Israel's worship. And after 500 years of all of this history, in the summer of 587 BC, the city fell to Babylon. It was all decimated and gone. And so the Book of Lamentations is a memorial to the pain and confusion of the Israelites that followed this destruction. Now the lament poems found here are not unique in the Bible. There's lots of them in the Book of Psalms. And these biblical poems of lament, they do a number of things. They're a form of protest. They're a way of drawing everybody's attention, including God's attention, to the horrible things that happen in this world that should not be tolerated. They're a way of processing emotion. So in these poems, God's people vent their anger and dismay at the ruin caused by people's sin and selfishness. And these poems are a place to voice confusion. Suffering makes us ask questions about God's character and promises, and none of this is looked down on in the Bible. Just the opposite. These poems of lament give a sacred dignity to human suffering. And so these human words of grief that are addressed to God have now become part of God's word to his people. The design of these five poems is very intentional. It's part of the book's message. So chapters 1 through 4 are called acrostics, which means alphabet poems. Each poetic verse begins with a new letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is made up of 22 letters. Now this very ordered and linear structure, it's in stark contrast to the disorder of the pain and the confused grief that's explored in these poems. So it's like Israel's suffering is explored A to Z and is trying to express something that is inexpressible. Chapters 1 and 2 each have one verse per letter, giving them a really similar design, but the themes are very different. So chapter 1 focuses on the grief and shame of a figure called Lady Zion. The poet personifies the city of Jerusalem as a widow, also called the daughter of them. And she sits alone. She's bereaved of her loved ones, devastated. No one comes to come. It's a very powerful method. And then Lady Zion speaks. She calls on the Lord to notice her faith. And through this image, the poet is showing that the city's destruction brought a level of psychological trauma that can only be expressed as the experience of a funeral and the death of a loved one. Chapter 2 focuses on the fall of Jerusalem and how it was a consequence of Israel's sin and was brought about by God's wrath, which is a key word in this poem. Now it's important to remember that in the Bible, God's wrath is not spontaneous, volatile anger. The biblical poets and prophets, they use this word to talk about God's justice. So Israel had entered a covenant agreement with God for centuries they've been violating it by worshiping other gods, perpetrating injustice, oppressing the poor. And so, yes, God is slow to anger, but he eventually does get angry at human evil, and he will bring his just anger in the form of punishment. In the case of Jerusalem, this involved allowing Babylon to come and conquer the city. And so this poem is acknowledging that God's wrath is justified, but this doesn't keep the poet from lamenting and asking God to show compassion 
Chapter 3 breaks this design pattern by having three verses per letter, so it's the longest poem in the book. And the voice is that of a lonely man speaking out of his suffering and grief as a representative of the whole people. And what's interesting is that this chapter is full of language that's drawn from other parts of the Old Testament, from the laments of Job and from other important lament songs, and even from the suffering servant poems of Isaiah. And the poet sees his hardship as a form of God's justice, like chapter 2 said. But, paradoxically, this is what gives the poet hope. And it leads him to offer the only hopeful words in the whole book. Because of the Lord's covenant faithfulness, we do not perish. His mercies never fail. They're new every morning. How great is your faithfulness, O oh God. So I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance, therefore I will put my hope in him. So the poet reasons, if God is consistent enough to bring his justice on human evil, then he'll also be consistent with his covenant promise to not allow evil to get the final word. And so for this poet, God's judgment is the seedbed of hope for the future. Chapter 4 goes back to the same alphabet structure as chapters 1 and 2. It is a vivid and disturbing depiction of the two-year siege in Jerusalem. And it contrasts how things used to be in Jerusalem of the past and how terrible they became in the siege. So children used to laugh and play in the streets, but now they beg for food. The wealthy used to eat lavish meals, but now they eat whatever they can find in the dirt. And the royal leaders used to be full of splendor, but now they're famished and dirty and unrecognizable. And the anointed king from the line of David been captured and dragged away. So the poem's power comes from the shock of these contrasts, and it's exploring the depth of the suffering that Israel brought to itself. Now the final poem is unique because it breaks the divine pattern. It's the same length as all the other alphabet poems, but the alphabet order is gone. It's like the poet can't hold it together anymore, and his grief has exploded back in the chaos. The poem is a communal prayer for God's mercy. Israel begs God not to ignore their suffering or abandon them. And the poem offers a long list of all of the different kinds of people who were devastated by the fall of the city. They ask God not to forget these people. And they lament on behalf of others, giving voice to their pain. Suffering in silence is just not a virtue in this book. God's people are not asked to deny their emotions, but voice their protests, to vent their feelings, and pour it all out. The book ends with something of a paradox. The poet acknowledges that God is the eternal king of the world, but also that Israel's circumstances make them feel like God is nowhere to be found. And so the final words of the book leave this tension totally unresolved. It asks, unless you've totally rejected us, and the book ends. The poet doesn't offer a nice, neat conclusion, much like our own experiences of pain and suffering. The story of the Bible doesn't end but this very important book shows us how lament and prayer and grief are a crucial part of the journey of faith of God's people in a broken world. And that's what the book of Lamentations is all about. Father in heaven, we thank you that instead of abandoning us when we sinned and rebelled against you, that instead you provided hope, that you provided your son as a sacrifice that was holy and pleasing and acceptable to you, that was complete in every way. And that he, through his life and through his work, gave us the pattern and the power by sending back the Holy Spirit to live a life above this sin, above the power of the deceiver and the dark one of this world, to live a life that brings you glory and honor. Open our ears to hear and our hearts to, to be written anew, Lord to recognize that we are a new creation in Christ and to live a life that brings worth and glory to you as we wait for the day of redemption that will come for those that trust in Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. So, when those times come, what do you do? There's nothing wrong with crying out to Jesus. And I, and I want to tell you something that may help, may not, because each of us are different when we get to that place. But if it's something like what we're reading about from the Israelites, they help bring that along themselves. And most time if we examine ourselves, we'll see that we brought along the circumstances ourselves. Not always. Jesus was clear. He said, do you think this tower fell on these people because they were bad? It's just things that happened. But many times we cause the circumstances that are around us.
See, the Israelites destroyed the temple long before God ever destroyed it physically through Nebuchadnezzar because they did not bring him worship. They brought him lip service. They marked off the boxes. They said, we're worshiping. They never took acknowledgement for their sins. They never put their faith and trust in the Lord their God. They didn't let Him direct their paths. They didn't acknowledge Him in all circumstances. So they cry out in Psalm 74 because they don't understand. But if we let God examine our hearts, we'll find out that we are sinful, that we deserve God's wrath. But because of His grace also through Jesus Christ, we can find redemption and peace. Now, we're living in a time of grace, but that doesn't mean we're not living in a time of obedience still, does it? Because even more I expect my child to obey me. What good parent does not discipline his child? And how much more does God know what discipline we need? See, the Israelites thought that there was no hope whatsoever. Jesus Christ came, Scripture says, when there was no hope. And He died for His enemies. But there's hope because God is faithful and true. He never broke His part of the covenant. Even when they were in captivity, He was there. He was making all things new, as the song says. But then you look out and say, well, why, why is the church destroyed? Whether it's this building or the church in general in the United States or in the world or whatever, God's still there. But well, when you see the temple destroyed, you, you kind of second guess, don't you? you like, where, where is God? Scripture is clear. He will never, ever forsake His sheep. So the temple was destroyed as God predicted by Nebuchadnezzar about 600 years before Christ. And Jesus foretold of the destruction of the temple again, which came in A.D. 70. There's one more time that Jesus talked about the temple being destroyed also, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But let's read Psalm 74 first. Let's see what this author had to say. He said, Oh God, why have you rejected us forever? Now, so we know that's not true, but that's how I fail when I'm writing this. Why does your anger smolder against the sheep of your pasture? It's not supposed to be against your sheep, right? Remember the nation that you purchased long ago, the people of your inheritance whom you redeemed, Mount Zion where you dwelt? God doesn't need to be reminded, but that's okay. We need to do this to understand. Okay, nothing wrong with it. Turn your steps towards these everlasting ruins. All this destruction the enemy has brought on the sanctuary. But remember I just said a minute ago, they destroyed the sanctuary long before uh, the Babylonians did. Your foes roared in the, the place where you met with us. But see, they didn't really meet with him. They set up their standards as signs. They behaved like men wielding axes to cut through a thicket of trees. They smashed all the car paneling with their axes and hatchets. They burned your sanctuary to the ground. They defiled the dwelling place of your name. They said in their hearts, we will crush them completely. They burned every place where God was worshipped in the land. We are given no signs from God. No prophets are left. <laughs> you wouldn't listen to the ones in the first place and you burned them alive or you sawed them in half. You didn't like their message when it wasn't a message you didn't want to hear. And none of us know how long this will be. How long will the enemy mock you, God? Will the foe revile, revel your name forever? Why do you hold back your hand? your right hand. Take it from the, fold, from the folds of your garment and destroy them. But God is my king from long ago. He brings salvation on the earth. It was you who split open the seas by your power. You broke the heads of the monsters in the water. It was you who crushed the head of Leviathan and gave it as food to the creatures of the desert. It was you who opened up the springs and streams. See, whenever we question God, it always brings it back to Him. It is you, God. It is you, God. It is you, God. It is you, God, that I should obey, that I should fear, that I should praise, that I should worship. It was you, verse 15, who opened up the springs and streams, who dried up the ever-flowing rivers. The day is yours, and, the, and yours also the night. You established the sun and moon. It was you who set all the boundaries of the earth. You made the summer and winter. Remember how the enemy has mocked you, Lord, how foolish people have reviled your name. Do not hand over the life of your dove to the wild beasts. Do not forget 
the lives of your afflicted people forever. Have regard for your covenant because because haunts of violence fill the dark places of the land. Do not let the oppressed retreat in grace. May the power, may, excuse me, may the poor and needy praise your name. Rise up, O God, and defend your cause. Remember how fools mock you all day long. Do not ignore the clamor of your adversaries, the uproar of your enemies, which rise continually. Well, thank goodness God doesn't just forget his enemies, because his enemies is what Jesus Christ died for, you and I when we nailed the nails in His hands and feet. Because we didn't want a Lord. We wanted a Savior, yeah. We wanted to say, hey, remember all these things, God, when we were not honoring Your name the way that we were supposed to. If you notice from this song, it never says, I have sinned to You, O Lord, and to You only, like David said when he was uh, confronted with his sin with Bathsheba. You know, I always find that Interesting. I'll use that as a word. He never said, forgive me for, for killing, forgive me for adultery. He said, forgive me for sinning against you. Because see, our first priority, the first commandment is, is to love the Lord our God. Jesus told us that. And from that will flow to love even our enemies as Christ loved and gave himself. When you lament... Cry out, but examine your heart also to see if some of this might be discipline rather than just struggles of life. And guess what? We live in a foreign world. We live in a fallen creation. We are aliens here. Our objective is to praise God and to tell others of Jesus Christ who was the suffering servant. Suffering is a part of this world because we chose to sin against God. But there is hope. There is a place where He will dry every tear. There is a place where there will be no more death and no more suffering. And if you are His sheep, you will obey the voice of Jesus and you will be carried into the fold. Life in a fallen and sinful world is tough, but God is faithful and true. Tehillim is the Hebrew name for the book of Psalms. Do you know that? Nope. Probably didn't. The name implies that the primary intent is a collection of psalms that render man's praise, his adoration, and worship to God. Even this song crying out, saying, Why me, Lord, what have I ever done? I've done plenty. Why, why me, Lord, what have I ever done to deserve grace? Nothing. Right? There's nothing wrong. This is a psalm of praise to God. Because even in our crying out, saying, why? Why are you doing this to me? It's going to point us to a God who loves us so much. So when I was studying a little bit, I found the Easy English Bible. It's Engli Easy English. I can't do Easy English. <laughs> Easy English dot Bible. And I challenge you to check it out. Easy English dot Bible. And I read this about Psalm 74, and I wanted to share this to, with you because it's just so childlike and innocent and so plain and so easy to understand. The temple was the house of God. It was a place where people came to pray to God and to worship Him. Worship means that you tell someone how great they are and that you love them. <laughs> the Israelites made several temples. The most important one was in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Enemies destroyed it twice. The second time it was the Romans 70 years after Jesus came to earth. Jesus had said that this would happen. Look at the top of this, of this psalm for what Jesus said. But about 600 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar also destroyed the temple. He was a king of Babylon. He took many of the Israelites to Babylon. We call this the exile. B.C. means before Christ came to the earth. Psalm 74 is about when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple. The psalmist asked God to think again, to keep His promises in verse 20, to remember His covenant. The covenant was when God and the Israelites agreed. God would protect them if they obeyed Him. The trouble was that they did not obey Him, so God let Nebuchadnezzar destroy the temple. He also took the Israelites in captivity to Babylon. There they had to do what He told them to do. They were in exile. Really, they were in prison a long way from home. Psalm 74 tells us what Nebuchadnezzar did to the temple. The Israelites were sorry because Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple. They were not sorry that they had disobeyed 
God. See, so many times we fail to recognize that in the midst of the storm. That is why God did not have to keep His promise because His children broke their promise. The psalm is broken up into three parts. Verse 1, the psalmist writes about Nebuchadnezzar destroying the temple in Jerusalem. He asks why God is so angry and that He allows this to happen. He asks why God does not do something about it. That's in verses 1 through 11. Verses 12 through 17, the psalmist remembers that God is very strong, that He made everything, and that He controls everything. Verse 18 to 23, so the psalmist asks, If you are so strong, why do you let people destroy your temple? See, we don't have all the answers. It is not for us to know the times and seasons, but it is for us by the power of God's Spirit to be His witness, to be His sheep, to be His obedient children, to gather instead of scattering. Can I ask you a personal question? I'm going to anyway. If you believe God is who He says He is, and you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, then why do you destroy God's temple? And don't tell me you don't. I'm going to speak for myself. Yes, I do. Many times. When I lean onto my own understanding, guess what I do? I destroy His temple. When I come to church but my heart's not really into it, I destroy His temple. When I'm singing these songs of worship and I really don't mean them, I'm just singing them, I'm destroying His temple. God made each and every one of us lovingly formed us, Scripture says, in our mother's womb to bring Him glory and honor. We are His masterpiece, Ephesians 2.10 says, created anew in Christ Jesus. Why would you not worship God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength? Scripture tells us to. It is our duty, our pleasing and proper worship is what Scripture says. So let's fast forward to the New Testament. Paul wrote this to a church, a body of believers, the hand and feet of Christ, to you and I, those who profess the name of Jesus, Christians, little Christ, like Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 3 through 17, we read it this way, Their work, yours and mine, will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. A reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? You and I are. God lives and dwells in us. So if we're the ones destroying the temple, especially now that God lives in us, not a man-made building, this is not a temple. You and I are. How much more because He gave His Son's life that you think we're going to make Him angry and deserve His wrath if we destroy His temple, if we mock His name? Verse 16, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? And don't miss the next verse. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together, you and I, are that temple. Paul goes on later to write to this church in chapter 6, starting in verse 12. Here's what you say. I have the right to do anything. I'm free. I'm saved. I can do whatever I want to. But not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. Jesus said you serve one master or the other. You save food for the stomach and the stomach for the food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality. And don't take this out of context. He's not talking only about sexual immorality. We just went over the book of Hosea. You've read Jeremiah. You've read Isaiah. He, God implies, He uses as example whatever word you want to when we're unfaithful to Him as in har- harlotry or adultery. 
Okay? The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By His power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and He will, also, will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ Himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? No, never. Do you not know that he who, who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Why do you think we have so many examples in the Old Testament of the adultery of God's people? To not be able to apply this here and say that it's only for, for physical adultery, for physical fornication. God is a jealous God. He is jealous for you just as I am jealous over my wife. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't want another man to touch her. She is mine. She made a covenant agreement with me as you made a covenant agreement with God through the blood of Jesus Christ to be His child. That you can cry out from, through His Spirit who lives inside of you, Daddy, Daddy, I'm yours. So how much more do we need to not destroy the temple? It is holy, and God will destroy the one who destroys His temple. Why did God let His temple be destroyed in Israel, the physical temple? So that He could rebuild it again, right? One reason that He did and why it was destroyed again is that I've mentioned to you before that three times the temple was destroyed. The other was Christ Himself. Because Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What was holy to God, His Son, He destroyed to save you. To bring you and I back in the fold so that we would never ever be separated. Many times we forget that. We don't give God the proper worship due for a God who would love us so much that He would send His Son. I also read this. This was from BibleStudyTools.com. The article is entitled, I Will Never Leave Nor Forsake You. Never Forsake You, Meaning of God's Promise for Your Life. Deuteronomy 31.6 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. The Israelites knew this verse well when they had to be in captivity. God commands our confident trust in Him. In a world that encourages us to believe in ourselves and to achieve all we desire, it's paramount to understand who and whose we are. Society sets a bar to earn and to accumulate. Accomplishments and accessories are lauded above humility and God-ordained purpose. Very often people have a hard time taking God at His word, wrote Jack Graham. If God says it, that settles it, and there's absolutely no reason to doubt it. So in a place of worldly standards, the Old Testament admonishment of Deuteronomy 31.6 can serve as a benchmark in our everyday lives. Hebrews 13.5 echoes the same sentiment, putting an extra emphasis on what not to have confidence in. It states, Keeping your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. What is the context of the verse in the Bible? Deuteronomy 31.6 was written to encourage the people of Israel. Their Old Testament reality presented their lives with insurmountable challenges. And God wanted them to know unequivocally that they could trust in Him to lead them to victory. They only knew a shadow of His promise and hope, as the video says. They didn't know that His Son would come and die on the cross to save them from their sins that He would give up heaven and lay down His life to restore yours back to a right relationship with God. Wow, what praise that we have to give God. Two verses later from Deuteronomy 31, 6, verse, verse 8, The Lord Himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. When we promise always or never, we are, aren't incapable, we aren't capable of upholding it. Thus the infamous saying, never say never. However, when God, God promises always or never, He can be fully trusted to honor His word. 
Genesis 28 verse 15 says, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Think about the promises that are in store for the children of God, sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Strengthening your faith in God. Our love of money threatens to steal the seed of our hearts. And when it does, we lose sight of the way God provides for us. We are made to honor Him, to give our, of ourselves, and to share our time in the provisions we've been blessed with as a result of the talents and gifts He, had, he has built in our lives. Jesus said, this is in the parable of the rich fool from Luke 12, verse 15, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possession, no matter what this world teaches you. Our current historical situation is consumed with covetousness. Social media is a breeding ground for us to loathe and long for another, situ another situation and stuff. The temptation is no longer out our window, but in the palm of our hands. The Apostle Paul lived through much tribulation, and he stated... Learn in whatever situation to be content, Philippians 4, 11. Philippians 4, 12 and 13, he writes, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul knew the way to be strong and courageous was through Christ. What does it mean for Christians to have God with them always? Romans 8, 10, and 11. And Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gave you, who gave you life, because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. When we profess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are sealed. From that point, the Holy Spirit lives on. I'm adding this. We are His temple. Build it up rather than destroying it. The article ends with a prayer for strength and courage. I'll read that prayer to you, and then we're going to watch part of the Ezekiel video to prepare you for that. And don't forget that I've got copies of Lamentations and Ezekiel here for anybody that wants it. This article ends with this prayer. Father, when we are not strong, you are. When we are weak, you carry us through. Our courage is rooted in your strength, which takes the anxieties we lift up to you and returns our pleas with a, with a peace that transcends all understanding. Father, it's hard to live at peace in this world. This side of heaven, strength and courage seem to be in short supply for the righteous people of God. Fill us, O Lord, with your presence, your purpose, and a yearning for your will rather than our own to come pass in our life. Thank you for loving us, leading us, and calling us home. Each day we are one step closer. Thank you for reminding us that you never leave us. No, you never will. Fill our days with purpose, purposeful pursuit of your love flowing through us. In Jesus' name, amen.